Welcome back from the break. We want to get launched. Want to get launched into this so that we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I, I do know um, Marta's brilliant, but she's not an attorney, so she doesn't have like a thousand slides. So we'll definitely, I believe, have time for interaction and everything like that. So that should be lots of fun. Marta Rodriguez uh, joins us today from Chicago. She is the executive director and defined contribution client advisor at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. She joined JP Morgan more than a decade ago, but she's been in this industry for more than two decades. She has a master's of accounting and finance management from the Keller Graduate School of Management and obtained her undergraduate degree from Illinois Wesleyan University. She also is a CFA charter holder. Uh, today, she'll be discussing JP Morgan's just released 2023 edition of the Guide to Retirement. I say just released because you were gonna have a bunch of hard copies and they literally have not been printed yet. Um, but um, for those of you uh, who are not aware, uh, this is a fantastic tool based on tons of research and science that J.P. Morgan Chase produces every year to help us understand and, anal and analyze um, retirement participant behavior. Uh, it draws conclusions from millions of data points among J.P. Morgan retirement plan participants, as well as Chase banking participants. And uh, for those of us in the business, um, it is uh, uh, really helpful for us to take the guesswork out of plan design. So will you please join me in welcoming Marta Rodriguez. Bring this down. Thank you so much, Troy, for the that warm introduction. And thank you all for being here. I feel like we're all spread out. We'd love to squish you all in the center, but that's okay. Um, really happy to be here and share with you all just some of our latest research that JP Morgan produces updates on the retirement landscape, as well as our more than two decades worth of research on participant behavior and how people interact with their plans through their contributions and, and their salaries and distributions and loans. And then also we have data around how people save for and spend in retirement. So let us share implications from that around plan design, as well as considerations for the financial wellness aspect that hopefully my goal for you all is to take away maybe one or two ideas that you can go back and, and implement within your own employer-sponsored retirement plans. I do plan on leaving some time at the end for any questions you may have too, so uh, please feel free to, to keep that in mind as well. Okay, there we go. <laughs> So if we're diving into the actual um, data, the insights from that, I think it's important to ground ourselves on where the data comes from. Here you'll see, if, starting from the far left, the 1.4 million DC participant lives. We have access to, through our own record keeping platform, as well as in collaboration with other platforms, these 1.4 million DC participant lives. And we've been re really looking at this data going back to 2001. So we have um, every two to three years, we update this participant data because not every year does this data um, change, but it is important to keep a pulse on what does change over time and what insights can we glean from that that impact how we think about uh, making our retirement plans um, more effective for our employees. That's why on the far right, you'll see Chase, um, the Chase logo there. We also do have, starting 10 years ago, we started to tap into in the Chase consumer banking side of things, how people actually spend their money, not only through their um, working years, but also as they approach retirement and in retirement itself. And that's afforded us a lot of um, insights into how do we, people think about spending the money as well as how they save the money within plans. And then half the U.S. population banks with Chase, so we do have a good representation of um, folks here in the U.S., and lastly, about three years ago, we started a research collaboration with EBRI, that's the Employee Benefits Research Institute, that allowed us to have access to an additional 23 million defined contribution and individual retirement accounts as well. Because before, we were looking really at how people saved in plans, and we knew that people left the plans and rolled them over into IRAs, but we didn't know what they did with it at that point in time. So with this research collaboration with them, we now holistically have a full really financial map of how people save for within their plans, how they spend their money throughout their working years, and again, into retirement itself. So with that as a background as to where the data comes from, I'm gonna skip to this next slide here, which gives us 
highlight some of the tr major trends that we're seeing in our latest research. And I'll dive into each one of these more specifically in the slides that follow. But starting at the upper left, you'll see that the average starting salary contribution rates are around 5%. And this is just looking at employee contributions. So not employer matches or profit sharing that's going into the plan, but employees themselves are on average starting at 5% contribution rates. This has been at this level for the last five, six, seven years now. But in the past, the numbers used to be higher. And we'll go into that in a little bit as to why we're seeing, seeing those numbers go down. Also, what hasn't changed that much from past studies is on the far right, that $70,000 average salary, and that's inflation adjusted salary for private industry workers. That also hasn't budged much in the last uh, really good seven, eight years as well. But what has changed, I mean, though contributions have gone down and salaries have remained pretty stagnant, we are seeing people spend more. And we'll go a little more into the detail on that as well, but that's not necessarily a recipe for success when we're thinking about how do we help people get on path to replace their income in retirement. And because people are spending more, when we think about retirement success, right, we want we define that as the ability to live similar lifestyles in retirement that we're living now, right? Now, so if my goal maybe is to you know ditch Illinois and go live in Iowa on this really fancy house in retirement. Well, maybe my goals will be, will be higher, but on average, for that seventy thousand salaried employee, historically the industry has said you need to have around eighty percent income replacement rate to be able to maintain your lifestyle, similar lifestyle in retirement. But because of the fact people are spending more, that did increase up to ninety two percent in our latest study, and I'll go over more of that in a, in a little bit as well. The last thing that we saw that did change more significantly from past studies is the upper middle there, which is the number of people who are actually staying in your plans post-retirement. Historically, we've seen a lot of people take, you know, upon retiring, they would take their money and leave, whether it's cashing out completely, rolling over into IRAs. But we've been seeing progressively the number of people staying in plan increase, and we'll provide a little bit of insights of that in a minute. So now we're gonna go into more of the specifics and we're gonna start off with that contributions as well as salaries. And here on the far left, you'll see contributions from our different studies going back to that 2007 study that looked at the 01 to 06 data, going to our latest study in, in 2021. And you'll see in the latest study again that the average contributions going in is at 5%, hitting 6% by age 45, but not really moving beyond that amount. If you go back far enough, the back in our 07 and 09 and really 2011 studies, people did were increasing their contribution rates. Presumably, as their salaries increased, they put away more money as well. Part of the reason why we're seeing these contribution rates go down is because of the Pension Protection Act in 06, which introduced a lot of great features and enhancements to retirement plans, including auto enrollment, auto escalation, the use of targeted funds as qualified default investment alternatives. A lot of these things were great for increasing participation, but it had negative effects on actual average contributions. So say, for instance, a lot of people, a lot of employers were very much gun ho on, yes, let's help increase our participation numbers, which will help with non-discrimination testing. So let's do auto enroll. And for some reason, the industry decided that 3% was a great auto enroll contribution rate for, for folks to go in. But when people got defaulted into these 3% contribution rates, employees who not on their own decided to do that due to participant inertia would just let it sit there and wouldn't increase as their own salaries increase. And we have seen that because of that, that the average contribution rates on average have come down. A lot of employers were not so gung-ho about doing the auto increasing along with the auto enrollment because they felt that for some employers, they felt it was too paternalistic or that they would get employee pushback from, um, their, from their workforce. But that is not the case. And just curious, um, by a show of hands for those in the room, how many um, people here within their plans do both auto enrollment as, as well as auto increasing? Okay, so some. Great, yes. So what... We think that it would really help with moving the needle in regards to being able to replace income for people need to, to maintain their lifestyles in retirement is 
beyond just doing the auto enrollment at 3%, we think it really should be more like 6% starting at auto enrollments, but also pairing that with that auto increase of 1% per year up to maybe say 10 or 15%. There's been a number of behavioral finance studies out there, which shows that really you can go up to 10% before employees will start to actually pulling back from that and, and decreasing their contribution rates. But that will go a long way to be able to help people get on track for replacing their income. I always say it's kind of like PB&J, the auto enroll and auto escalation kind of go together. So that's looking at contributions. When we go to the right-hand side, when we look at um, salaries and salary raises, you'll see at the upper right that um, through the studies historically, we've seen that you know every two to three years or every other year, there have been salary raises, which is great to see that. But what you'll notice on the bottom right is that when you look at inflation-adjusted average salaries over the years, and again, this is for private industry workers, it's remained pretty steady at that $70,000 um, mark. And that's in your peak earning years. Now, recently, of course, we've seen wage growth for the last couple of years, which it's been great to see that. But unfortunately, it's come along with some pretty nasty inflation numbers as well. And part of that wage growth has actually led to some of the inflation that we're seeing in the economy. This is actually now the 24th month where inflation has outstripped wage growth. Right. So whereas, you know, we've seen wage growth because in this tight labor force environment, we're trying to attract people to work at our companies. We're offering higher wages, but at the same time, they're also paying more in, in utilities and in food and in transportation and in shelter. So, again, this is a concern that we see out there, which is why a lot more, you know, thoughts around how do we then from a financial wellness education perspective, get in front of people and help them with around topics such as as budgeting. And maybe later on, you know, with the Secure 2.0, we heard earlier from Preston with some emergency savings provisions that are available coming next year in 2024, maybe looking at that as ways to be able to help um, their employees be able to feel confident in their ability to put more weight into their 401k plan. So now that we looked at contributions and we look at salaries, we're going to look at the other end, the distributions and loans. Ideally, we would love it if everybody were to start contributing into their 401k plan early, first out, right out of school, at healthy rates, and not touch it until they retire. But unfortunately, life happens, right? And emergencies come up, as well as the when people actually have the ability to take money out of their plans without getting penalized for it, we see that they do. So when you look at that pre-retirement distributions on the far left-hand side, You'll notice though, thankfully that um, over the years, the percentage of people taking out pre-retirement distributions starting at age 59 and a half has gone down. It's now around six to 10% of folks that are between ages 59 and a half to 65 that are tapping into their account balances. But what we've seen is that when they do so, they're they do so decisively. Historically, they've taken out smaller amounts um, starting at that age, but now they're taking out on average around 55% of their account balance when they do decide to take that money out. As well, similarly, when we take a look at the loans, so the far right-hand side, here you'll see that, again, um, it's been nice to see the actual percentage of people taking out loans has been going down over the years. Um, in our latest study, it went down from 18 to 13% of folks taking out loans, but the amount that people do take out is on average still on 20%. One word on loans, I think um, we can do a lot uh, more as well around education, around implications, negative implications of taking out loans when we sit down and do employee education, because it, you know, it does have an impact on their ending account balance, especially those who tend to be revolving loan takers, right? And um, Things to consider, again, with the Secure 2.0 and the ability to have that emergency savings account available um, starting in 2024 may be worth considering because if we can get people then to have money set aside in this ESA, it's less likely that it's more likely that they will tap into that when the roof needs to get replaced or the car breaks down and before tapping into the 401k plan, which is invested in the, in the markets. Because it's been shown too, right? That if you do take out money, if people, even though they pay themselves back, 
the the fact where lies a lot of people when they pay themselves their loan back into the plan, they're they're not going above and beyond with their original contribution amounts that they're putting in, which is which gets the employer match that goes along with that contribution. So even though they're paying themselves back, they may they may be missing out on that match for that time period in which they are repaying that loan, and you. Fast forward, if you look at just different simulations, you know, that does have a big impact on the ending account balance compared to someone who just let the money sit and contributing at the same rates and letting the market work for them. Now, this is the one stat that has significantly changed from um, our past studies. And I think it's, it's worth spend, spending a little bit of time on this. And this, again, is the fact that um, the number of people staying in the plan, historically, they retired and they took their money. They left. We saw the majority, like 80% of folks that would take their money and leave. The last time we ran this study, we actually saw that the number of people staying in the plan jumped from 28% to 42%. That's pretty significant. We think that may be the case for a few different reasons. One, the, the more awareness and education around um, having access to institutionally priced share classes that they can't get on their own, such as you know, your no revenue share classes, your R6 shares, or your CITs, your commingled funds, they can't get that on their own. So more education, hey, if you stay, you can access these lower expense um, funds, it's attractive. Additionally, more um, record keeping plans um, have more services around retirement calculators and how best to draw down assets and more guidance in that, as well as um, manage, the rise of managed accounts recently and more personalization to help people think about now that we got you to point B, here's how we can help you, you know, live in your retirement years. So as the more services and solutions are being brought to the table, I do envision that number will stay um, pretty on the, on the higher end just because of some of the advantageous things that are available to folks inside the plan. And of course, as plan sponsors, a lot of us, you know, like to have people stay in for economies of scale and be able to um, have certain price points with record keepers by having higher assets. But then also one thing to know, if we do have more and more people stay, we got to keep track of where they go as well, right? So if, if employees leave us, having you know a really good record of where people live and where they go because certain notifications do need to be sent out still on a regular basis and so that is something you know worth considering as well why i think this also this is percentage this stat is important is around the concept and topic of retirement income and just curious by show of hands again has anybody heard any you know any, the topic or theme about retirement income solutions in this room a few. Okay, great. Yeah, so due to the fact, of course, that a number of us, um, especially younger generations and then the millennials and Generation Zs that come on board, a lot of these people don't have access to pension plans. My dad had a pension plan and he got to retire six years ago and he's doing well with this guaranteed income that's coming to him and it's a beautiful thing. Right. But in an era where a lot of responsibility now for saving for retirement falls on us and the, our employees and a defined contribution space, we've been trying for the longest time as an industry to DBFI our DC plans. Right. So, again, through the use of those auto features and through the use of diversified portfolios like target date funds or risk based funds to help people save for retirement, we kind of have solved for that accumulation phase of retirement. But now, how do we help people think about decumulation of living their best retirement years? And I'll show you in a bit some of the slides we have around the data around what people actually do from their IRA perspective, which isn't really supportive of how we see people actually spend their money in retirement. So this, um, this goal to be able to help people think about how best to draw down assets is something that we as an industry are coming up with solutions around whether that be implant solutions or out of plan solutions, whether that be annuity based or non annuity based, or just tacking on a, 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 a target date, uh, the end of a target date funds, um, a retirement income vintage for people to draw upon. Either way, this is something that will continue to evolve over time and something that I encourage you to be working with a uh, either a consultant or retirement plan advisor to help you sparse through all that that is available and that is coming to see hey what is what 
is appropriate or may or may not be appropriate for you in your specific situation and your employees. So again, something that will continue to evolve, a lot of great solutions that are currently in place, but more to come. And there's definitely some pros and cons out there. So it helps to work with somebody to help sparse through all that data. Oops, I went too fast. No, I didn't. There we go. So I mentioned people are spending them a lot. I like spending money. My kids like spending money. We, as a, as a, as a US Americans, we we have been spending more money. You see on the right hand side, this comes from the the Consumer Expenditure Survey data, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics here, and you'll see that you know on average we have been spending personally more over time. There was a significant dip in 2020, right? That's when. COVID came and we were we were stuck at homes, we weren't traveling, we weren't going on vacations or spending on services, but we did see that number jump right back up in 2021, even though we were you know, kind of still hybrid-ish and working at home and not, we know there was government assistance that was aided to help with the pandemic, so people were receiving this money and they're like, well, you know, let's not only save more, we saw our savings rates increase a lot at this point in time, but they actually were spending more because they had more than they used to. Fast forward in 2020, we're right back up there again in 2022 and spending more. And because of this, again, when we think of what is our goal and what we consider a retirement success is being able to maintain our lifestyle today, similar lifestyles in the retirement as well. So because of that, our income replacement rate or the goal that we set for ourselves did increase um, from 80% to 92%. And you'll see that there on the far left-hand side. Now, some silver lining good news there is that if you look at the purple color, the social, the amount that comes from Social Security did increase as well due to cost of living adjustments. Um, but the blue, um, that's our own private, that comes from private sources and, and from your 401k plans, that onus on us to save more did increase from 34 to 38% as well. Again, the ever importance of how do we think about not only education and, and budgeting and helping with student loans and ESA, but then also plan design wise, how do we get people more on board through auto enrollment and auto escalation to get them to be able to save more, to be able to replace more and live the, the retirements that, that they wanna live. But that income replacement rate that I mentioned at 92%, that's just on average for that 70,000 salaried um, household. That does change depending on your salary itself. For folks who make more than that, more north of 100,000, for instance, you'll see that the actual income replacement rate does go down. But the amount blue, what's required of you as employees um, for your own private savings, that percentage does go up because you get less from Social Security. On the flip side, for those folks who make less than at 70,000 to 30, 40, 50,000, their income replacement rate is actually higher because frankly, anything they have coming in is needs to be spent on basics, right? For living, right? And your shelter and home and transportation and food. But the good news on that front is that they do um, can expect to have more from Social Security versus their own personal savings. I think it's interesting to, to look at the spending side of things. And this, again, comes from our, consumers, our consumer banking side of the family. And we have access to view this um, data, of course, all anonymously. I don't know what Troy spent on coffee this morning, but... Uh, we we have pulled pull all this data anonymously to take a look at how people spend their money through their working years and into retirement itself. And it's interesting to see that people spend most in their mid 40s, early 50s, which is also their peak earning years, because the more we make, the more we tend to spend. Also, this is when we tend to have more, our households are bigger, right? So we are, the kids are still at home. Um, so there are the, the more is spent on, on utilities and cell phones and mortgages and food. I have two teenage boys and they're eating me out of, out of house and home. Um, but as they, you know, as you get older, right, as into your you know, approaching retirement households, you know, the number of people goes down and costs go down. And we look specifically at retirement, the majority of the spending happens when, early in retirement. When you're taking on new hobbies, for instance, or when you're adjusting to a new lifestyle, when you have time on your hands to go travel, right? So a lot of that spending happens early on in retirement. Um, it does level off though, around in your around 80, 85. 
with only really the only categories that are increasing being that of healthcare as well as that of housing. And what wouldn't think necessarily that housing costs would necessarily stay pretty steady, but even if you've paid off the home, your mortgage, as people age now in aging homes, there's a lot of maintenance uptick um, you, that, that people have to consider from not only replacing the boilers and the roofs, but also landscaping that maybe you've done in your past on your own, but no longer physically able to do. So you're hiring folks to do that, et cetera. So these are costs that are um, important to, to keep in, in the back of your mind as well. And of course, people are living a lot longer. And this is top of mind, again, for why we as an industry are thinking a lot about the retirement income topic, again, the solutions in the space is because, because people are living longer, they're looking to their employers for help around and more certainty in their ability to retire when they want to retire on their own terms. And the fact where it lies on the far left-hand side, you'll see in blue that if you're a healthy 65-year-old couple today, the chance of you or your spouse living to age 90, sorry, to age 85, is almost 90, is 90%. That's a high probability, right? And, and that's first and foremost what people are worrying to people when they retire is that they no longer have income coming in. Right, and so they're concerned about how do they how do they spend their money, and they're looking for guidance and help around that. And unfortunately, sixty seven percent of the U.S. population does not have access to a financial advisor or any sort of financial guidance. And a lot of that is because of the fact that a lot of people's account balances aren't high enough that necessary financial advisors are knocking on their doors wanting to work with them per se. Which is why I think a lot more is on us as employers and plan sponsors as to. Is this something that we want to tackle? Is this something we want to help out with? Because when we do employee surveys and participant surveys, which we do every couple of years at JP Morgan with plan participants, when we ask them, the last time we, we asked them was a couple of years ago, if you had an in-plan retirement option available to you that would help, that would kick off a stream of income to you throughout your retirement, would you be willing to stay in the plan? And 88% of them said yes, All right? So they're looking to you all as employers for, for more guidance and help with solutions that would help with that particular need. And this is also, uh, I mentioned before, why we're a bit concerned about and why we think that that retirement income conversation is one that will prevail for a while is due to the fact that now we can actually see through that EBRI data, the Employee Benefits Research Institute data, what people do from with their money once it's in IRAs, a lot of people aren't drawing down their assets until the RMD age. And you heard from Preston this morning that that RMD age is getting higher, right? We went from 70 and a half to 72, now 73, now it's 75 in about 10 years. Because the fact we're in life is that they don't, they're not getting guidance from elsewhere. So if the RMDs are using that as kind of their, their withdrawal guidance as to how much they should take out, similarly to how they use an employer match as guidance as to how much they should contribute to a plan, which frankly isn't always enough either when we think about saving for retirement. But they're not getting any sort of guidance elsewhere. And so because of that, a lot of people who are sitting, getting to retirement, they're afraid to tap into their money because as they hear all the time, I'm going to live till age 90, 100. I don't want to run out of money. And there are people who, the people who are taking out, um, there aren't the money from the IRAs prior to RMDs are those who have four times the wealth as the average, because most likely they're working with a financial advisor who is able to holistically take a look at their full retirement picture, their full financial picture and what their goals are, et cetera, to help draw down in an efficient way. But um, because of the fact that, and if you also take a look at how RMDs get calculated, the biggest payouts happen when you're actually in your mid-90s, right? When you look at the actuary tables and how that thing gets calculated, which if you remember the slide that showed the retirement spending, majority of it happens right when you're in your mid-60s or 70s. So it does it, it's not really the most efficient way to draw down assets. Again, how do we then, and do we want to take it upon us to figure out ways to help educate folks on how to best draw down assets then in retirement in some form um, within our own um, retirement plan, something worth um, considering? I'm going to switch gears and go away from our participant research data 
to some of the slides that um, Troy was mentioning that comes from our latest guide to retirement, which is um, for this year. And I think some of these slides are helpful for um, not only, again, some plan design considerations, but also for employee education. Right, so if you are looking for some good slides, this is a wealth of information. Now, the guide to retirement does have around 50 plus slides. I'm only going to share maybe six or seven with you. But if, if any of these are interesting to you, and if you want to get more of this, um, it's available on our website, jpmorganfunds.com. Also, you can hit up Troy. He can let me know if you, anybody here wants any hard copies of those um, to make available to you. But I like to set the stage first with this slide that shows the retirement equation. And this is great when you're sitting down with employees to help them think about what's in their control and what's not, right? So there's a number of factors that affect our ability to have good retirement outcomes. And some of these factors are completely out of our control. Some things are somewhat in our control and other things we do have more control over. And that's what we want to focus on and help our employees be able to, to do something about. So starting with the blue, right? The stuff that we have no control over. Market returns, last year, craziness, right? And who could have expected that not only the equity markets to be down so much, but also fixed income. We haven't seen that in over 40 years, right? People, we have no control over that whatsoever, right? Similarly, with Secure 2.0, recent legislation, recent mandates, what happens on Washington, D.C. around policy regarding taxation as well as safety and benefits, we don't have any control over that either. We can learn from it and we can adapt to it, but we have no control over that either. Some things that for which we have somewhat control over is in green. The longevity, up to a certain point, we have some control over that. We can try to live healthy lives and eat right and exercise, but of course, some of us have hereditary issues that unfortunately we don't have control over. But there's a point where we can control somewhat our longevity and how long we live. Employment and earnings and duration is also something that's somewhat in our control. We choose who we want to work for, what type of industry we want to work for, and how long we can work for. You'll see in a little bit that that duration is somewhat out of our control based off of um, health problems or disability that kicks in. But on average, this is things that we somewhat have control over. What we do have more control over is the stuff here in purple. Um, and starting at the top, the asset allocation and location, right? Offering to our employees of diversified portfolios for which to invest in is key to helping them not only stay invested in the markets as it does provide better returns with less volatility than if people were to just pick amongst stocks and bonds on their own, but it's also a lot better than them sitting in cash. And I think a lot of uh, or a money market account. And I feel a lot of younger folks who are coming in and seeing what's happened to perhaps their parents, whereas they know they need to save more, they're somewhat, you know, skeptic about, you know, the markets and what they've been seeing. So how do we help them, you know, to understand that you not only do you need to save for your retirement, but you need to make sure that you are in a properly diversified portfolio and also asset location. We don't really think about this as much, but diversification from a tax perspective is also important. Again, Preston mentioned this morning, a lot of the Roth, you know, features a lot of that being ways that the government, you know, is weighted to, for them to get their taxes early on. However, it does afford us um, as employees, if we have flexibility then when it comes to retirement, that we have both pre-tax and after-tax um, accounts to, from which to draw upon, we can then be more, much more flexible on how we think about more efficiently drawing down those assets in retirement. So that's something that we do have control over. Other things we have control over, of course, are saving and spending up to a point we can help people again with um, being more confident in their ability to save more with more education around help around um, you know, budgeting needs and helping them with, you know, student loan debts or, or um, emergency savings accounts that can go help a long way to help people be able to be saved more for retirement. And up to a point, we have control over how much we spend and what we spend that money on and what priorities we have for ourselves. So that's when we think about the retirement equation. I mentioned before that our, we're, gonna, we're living a lot longer. And so I often hear from people, well, if I'm living longer, I'll just work longer, right? I'm going to work till I'm 65, 70 years old. And some of us, depending on the industry, are blessed to work in industries where we perhaps we can work um, for, for many, many years. But what's interesting, though, is if you look at the left 
hand charts there is that these are expectations of current workers today. 69% of them expect to retire at age 65 or older, where in actuality, only 34% experience that the actual median retirement age currently is at 62. And the reason for that is on the right hand side. So the right hand side gives you reasons for why people are retiring earlier than they would have planned with the number one reason, almost a third of folks retiring earlier because of a health problems or disability kicks them out of the workforce. They plan to work long, but they, they couldn't, right? That or company downsizing and all of a sudden maybe their skill set isn't, you know, it isn't applicable anymore and they could train to do something different, but a lot of folks are, aren't willing to do that after a certain age, right? Or they have to take care of a family member. Nursing home care costs are pretty expensive, right? So if, if all, all of a sudden a parent is staying with you and, and you have to take care of that individual, um, there's choices that you made. So what I like to use this chart for people is, you know, life happens. We try to plan our best, but we never know what's going to happen because of that. It's very important that we encourage folks to not only save early, but to save enough to be able to, to deal with retirement earlier than we may or may not expect it. Now, I plan on being that purple one. I hope you all do too. At the bottom, which is able to afford it. I definitely want to retire before I'm age 65, but uh, we'll see how I am on track for that going forward. I mentioned before the fact that a lot of the younger generation is not having access to pensions. Then I think this chart just shows, it's, it's great to see that the fact that really when you look at the baby boomers, they were really the last generation there that had meaningful access to um, pensions. But really when you're thinking of hiring and, and, and looking at um, folks coming into the workforce now, and really, and also the millennials who they've they've been in the workforce for quite a while, a lot of them don't have access to defined benefit pension plans anymore, which is why, again, it's so very much more important as DC providers, plan sponsor providers, to how do we best equip our folks to not only to replicate that experience by not only helping them save as much, but then also help them think about uh, how do they spend in retirement itself to replicate that DB experience. Going to go to what we lovely refer to as our heart attack chart, which I don't think is that much of a heart attack chart anymore. But I think this is this is helpful for, again, employee education meetings. If you ever get the question, hey, am I somewhat on track right now for retirement? And this is the way to read this and utilize this is that you have your household income across the top. And then you have your age on the vertical axis on down. So example, let's take a household income of 50,000 and someone who's 40 years of age, go to where those two intersect. You have a multiplier there of 1.4. So 1.4 times $50,000 means that that person should have around $70,000 right now as a 40 year old to be on track to replace their income in retirement, assuming all the things on the right which is basically assuming that you're contributing, that you are continuing to save 5% of your salary, um, as well as you're in a diversified 60-40 portfolio, and you plan to retire at age 65, et cetera. So again, I mean, it, this is more used in, in a larger setting um, when you're people are working with individual financial advisors can get more detailed specifications around their specific situation. But I think this is helpful to encourage folks, you know what, am I somewhat on track? Awesome, I pat myself on the back. But if not, maybe I can, you know, let's talk about maybe how much I can put additional I can put away to get on track. And we have that not only for the um, salaries that are less than 100,000, we also have that um, for those of 100 to $300,000 as well. This chart I think is helpful for folks, especially um, again, depending on who you're talking with in your audience, if you are trying to get younger folks um, to save more for retirement early, I think this is helpful to get them and give them an idea as to how much they need to start saving now. If up to this point, they have not saved anything, right? And this, again, by way of how to read it, so you have a 25-year-old earning $50,000, 6% is the amount that they should have, that they should, savings amount that they should put away. And this includes, by the way, employer contributions as well. So it's a very attainable number. Um, if you think about employee and employer money going in. Um, and, it's, and it's encouraging, right? Because I think 
part of the um, the problem that we news media and the industry at times, you know, we hear about, well, we need a million dollars in our accounts to be able to be to have for retirement. And that messaging can be very discouraging for for individuals when maybe they're if they're earning year, if the peak earning is 70,000. Technically, their income replacement rate puts them around five hundred and twenty thousand dollars of what they need in time of retirement to replace that income. So if we say we need a million dollars, that again can be very discouraging and people will actually will decide, I can't do it. So they'll just give up completely and not want to put anything away. I think this could be helpful as they, hey, it is possible. It's very attainable. And here's what you need to do at this age in order to be on track to replace your income in retirement. But again, I know that it's so hard, and especially when you're talking to some folks who are maybe, you know, just coming off of school and they're your first um Time, time employees that they have a lot of competing things that they're, trying, that they're they're calling on them, right? So they not only are trying to pay down their student debt, they may be saving for down payment for their first home. They may be saving for a marriage, you know, weddings, weddings are expensive. They're, they're, there's always going to be these competing factors for that one income. But if you can show to them, hey, this is really attainable when you're young. And by the way, you know, be it three or 4%, because again, this is just including employee and employer, but be three or 4% of a $60,000 salary isn't that much, right? So we it is completely attainable and let's get you on track for that. Of course, it does get a lot harder when you do get older. So if folks are in their 40s and 45 year olds and they haven't saved a thing. Those percentages do get um, a, a higher and, and somewhat, you know, a little bit more unattainable. But again, this was really good to encouraging people to start saving early and um, enough. This chart I think is interesting. And this kind of goes along with that um, spending chart I showed, I showed earlier. We saw in, in 2020, right, that the spending went down a lot. Look at how much the savings, annual savings rate, rate skyrocketed in 2020. On average, when you look at savings rates going back to 1960, it's averaging out 7.8%. 2020, it jumped up to 15%. So people, again, they weren't spending as much money. So they were drawing down credit card balances. And we did see that through our Chase consumer side of things. They were starting to put away more money. And with, again, some government assistance through the pandemic, it actually boosted savings rate as well in 2020 and 2021. But then because they have also this extra income, again, as you saw people, even though they spent more, sorry, spent less in 2020, they started to spend more again in 2021. And you see that that number is starting to come down. And then last year dramatically decreased to 3%. Again, people, I think, were for a time like, hey, I can spend the same amount as I spent last year, even though now they no longer are getting any that government assistance. They no longer are in the fact that inflation, again, has been outstripping wage growth for now two years running. It, people are starting to feel that in, in, in their pockets. And it push comes to shove. We're going to start to, see, and we have been seeing also from the consumer side, banking side of things, credit card balances are again going up, right? So people are tapping more into that in order to continue with the spending that they've been used to for the last couple of years. So because of that, I think it's more important well, one, we're, we're going to see probably that number shift the other way as people are going to start to ha start to tighten their belts more. And it will probably have an impact on the GDP numbers and go into somewhat of a softer recession because, you know, consumer spending makes up a big portion of GDP. But what this means for us as employers, again, is how do we help people from an education perspective to think about how do we, you know, how does how does our savings change over time, spending priorities, budgeting, and help around that? And again, plan design perspective wise, how do we help people by using participant inertia for them by getting them into um, contributing at rates through auto enrollments and auto escalations to be able to help them be on track for replacing their income in retirement? The benefit of saving and investing early, I think this one is great to hone in on two overall big messages. One, yes, it pays to not only um, invest early, but also to for people to invest in the markets, to not be afraid of investing in the market. So we start off with the person in blue. If you compare the person in blue to the person in green, 
they both are saving, you know, putting away $200 monthly, right, from age 25 to age 65. And the one in blue has a very nice healthy balance at age 65 of around $512,000. The one in green, however, was maybe it was, la maybe they started just to, they entered the workforce last year and the markets were going haywire. And like, I don't know about this. I know I have to save, but I don't trust what's going on in the markets, right? So there's going into their stable value offering in their 401k plan or the cash. And again, just due to the fact that we don't check in on a regular basis and due to participant inertia, that money just kind of sits there and doesn't move outside of them. By letting that sit there, of course, the balance at the end of the day is a far cry from that 512 that their colleague had by investing in the markets. Similarly, if you compare the, the purple and the black, this is more messaging around the importance of saving early. And here we have, for instance, the one in black, which started saving um, from age 25 because they heard from their parents that it's important that you start saving early. So they started at age 25, socking away $200 monthly to age 35. But then life happens, other things, you know, they had to, you know, pay for a home, car, et cetera. They stopped contributing to their plan. But they kept their money in the plan and they let the markets work for them. And their assets actually grew to around $270,000. Compare that to the one who waited 10 years. So they, it wait, they started contributing at age 35 versus 25. And they saved from age 35 to 65. So they put away a lot more of their own money. But because they started just 10 years after the person who started earlier and stopped contributing, their account balance is actually a little bit higher. Again, the power of the compounding of, of being invested in the markets and something that is important from an education perspective to make people aware of, especially if we are dealing with younger employees. Like I know it's so hard, right? Because those are also the years when they make less money. But the importance of saving for this long-term goal that's far, far away is uber important to be able to have any chance of having a successful retirement for that they may be dreaming of. And the last slide that I, I want to share with you before opening up to any questions, and I know that you probably are sick of hearing auto enrollment and auto escalation, but I really do think this is a powerful plan design tool um, that helps people get to the point, again, to have uh, better retirement outcomes. And here we're, so, again, we have three different personalities. We used to have some fun names to go with these. Like we used to have a consistent Chloe, an escalating Ethan, and um, I forgot the other one, but I, I guess marketing did, you know, didn't want us to use fun names anymore. But we have this consistent 10% contribution earner at the top. Ideally, we would love it if everybody could do that, right? But 10% contribution is a hard pill to swallow right when you're starting off in the workforce. And it's like, eh, don't want to do it, right? The other end of things is we then see, again, the use of auto-enrollment and the industry average for so long being auto-enrolling it at 3%. And again, due to participant inertia, we don't, if it's not paired with auto escalation, people will stick at that 3% contribution limit. And they're not then, you know, see how the balance goes up to 880,000 versus the one that was at 2.2 million. Compare that to the one of the auto enrollment paired with the auto escalation. So you auto enroll someone in that 3%, increase 1% year over year to age, um, to, to capping at 10%. And because they did this early on in their working years of the market work for them, you'll see that their balance is almost the same as the one that started off at 10% right away. So again, this is an easier way to, when you think about behavioral finance, to ease people into saving more on their behalf and they can adjust to the salaries that they have coming into them. And they, again, they don't even really notice up until really get close to 10% beyond when you start to see people meaningfully take that contribution rate down. So again, I think from a plan design perspective, super helpful to consider for those who haven't yet um, or are still debating, this is a great way to, to be able to help people help themselves to be better on track for a more secure retirement um, going forward. So with that, again, we have 
I have 40 more of these GT guided retirement slides if anybody's interested. <laughs> um, they're all fascinating. They, they go over saving and spending and social security, healthcare, and it's all charts and graphs that really are meant to use to help to simplify the complexities of those different topics. If you are interested again, feel free to hit Troy up for any, um, uh, we can either email or make hard copies sent to you in the mail as well. So with that, I will um, open up to any questions that anybody may have. I think we have like, five minutes or so. Or if not, we can end early for lunch too, whatever you want. <laughs> Amazing, yes. How many loans to offer? And and so offer my opinion, and I'll invite Troy too, if he, you know, what he, cause he has a practice himself um, with retirement plans that he works with, but Really, and I, I think having a loan provision is a way, again, that plan sponsors have used to attract employees to participate in the plans. Like, hey, we'd love it if you participate in your 401k plan. By the way, we have loans available to you if you, emergencies do come up for you to tap into. Um, most of them we see around two, you know, plans, two loans that um, are available for the, the loan provisions. Um, and then, of course, you know, we keeping an eye, I think it's helpful on there tends to be the same people that will on a regular basis take in and take out, take in and take out. And maybe like, is there a way to market or educate or set them aside? Like, hey, let's let's sit down and like talk about why this may be the case and you know how this could be detrimentally affecting their ability to save for the long term. But that's what we see on average. And Troy, do you want and for, for the plans that you work with, what has been more common loan provisions that you've seen? I know that I don't need a mic. I'll need a, I'll use a mic for the recording for people listening. I, I think the question was kind of like, what would you recommend? And, and just in case the JP Morgan police are watching, I know that JP Morgan wouldn't recommend two loans. Um, most of us would say zero is a really great place to be. And on average, I see one or less. So I don't want anyone leaving thinking that two loans is appropriate. So I think that's important. And she keeps saying something about hitting me up. I don't work for JP Morgan, yeah. but we we did have this idea that she was gonna bring a whole bunch of these guys to retirement and they literally didn't get printed. So she's gonna ship some to me so we can get them to people or whatever. Um, I had a comment since I have the mic and, I, and we can pass the mic if people have questions, but you had an earlier slide that talked about more people staying in the plan, which I think is, it's a substantial difference of recent I just wanted to say, and this might be somewhere in your data, I have seen that skewed considerably by plan size. So larger plans, more people are staying in the plan. Smaller plans, more people are exiting. I think it has a lot to do with who works with the plan. So like if you have a dedicated specialist, that's probably not like trying to call on individuals for capturing rollovers and things like that. Many of those larger plans have a dedicated specialist and most of those invest, most of those monies are staying in the plan. So that's a trend that we've seen. But I think, I think those that uh, smaller plans probably see more exiting. So. Yes. And, and because of the fact that again, when you're thinking of people more staying in the plan, you have to keep track of where they're all at with small, with, sorry, with smaller businesses, um, it is harder, right? They don't have the staff to be able to, to keep track of all that as well. And so a lot of them are encouraging, right? Um, and also plan design, plan documents are written in a way to be able, you know, to, hey, it needs to be out at certain limits or like they don't offer periodic distributions. It's either like they keep it in or they take the whole thing out. So again, I, it's more the larger plans that we do see are encouraging folks to to stay in again because they get price points too if we have more assets we can get lower overall costs for our plan with different record keepers so that's a trend but then also they tend to be more the larger plans to tend to be more paternalistic and they are thinking well how do we help people not only save for retirement but help them spend in retirement itself and they're using that as a way from an employee benefits perspective to attract 
these um, these these employees because a lot of them, when you do those participant surveys, they're looking for more guidance. They are asking for more guidance. They don't want to be told what to do, but they are looking for more guidance from their um, employers on help on how much they should save and what they can take out, et cetera. So um, a lot more is on us as, as plan sponsors and employers to how do we help not only prepare them, provide them with the information, but continue to be on the latest trends when it comes to solutions that are being made available through the industry to be able to meet those needs. And yes. Recommended percentage of employer. Oh, how much they should be saving? Yes. Okay. So again, compliance, fully legal people, and recommendations. Um, but as far as his, you, if you look at industry norms and what people are quoting out there, they're saying between ten to fifteen percent is what people should be saving. So when you take a look at the historical annual savings rate, which is on average been around seven point eight percent, historically it has always been below what people recommend. But again, it is also dependent on right what your salary is, right? And obviously the people who make less than average, right? I, they're going to get more from social security in some form or another versus those who don't. So technically they don't need to be saving as much, but we always want to encourage. We don't want to say that because we always want to encourage as most savings as possible. But yes, the recommended in the industry is between 10 to 15% combined employee and employer together. Any other questions? If, yeah, oh, okay, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. So when we see the auto escalation happening, we do see that historic has uh, average and capping out at that 10%. But I do know there are advisors that I work with that encourage 12 up to 15% um, before capping out. When you look again at a number of behavioral finance studies out there, like Stolo Bernardsis and others, I mean, they do, it, it, it has been shown that employees won't necessarily blink an eye as much until you really get past that 10%, um, Max, there. Then they're like, hey, what's going on? And they'll start to, to pull back on there or opt out of that. But um, so historically, we've seen that that 10% is where people, um, would encourage your plan sponsors to cap out at. Um, but again, depending on the workforce and the demographics, I and mean, the more you say, the better. So some are actually encouraging um, going up to even 15%. Any other questions? If not, you guys have been awesome. So thank you again for your time. And it's, uh, it's lunchtime, I believe. <laughs>